Let me read to you a passage from the 13th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 24 to 43. It's the Gospel for Sunday of the 16th week in Ordinary Time, Year A. I will only read part of it because it is a long passage. St. Matthew writes, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. That's part of the passage for this particular day that I read, that I mentioned earlier. It speaks somewhat of faith. You know, one of the signs of a good education, as opposed to, say, just acquiring a lot of information, is that a person does not take things simply on faith. As the years of schooling proceed, the pupil is increasingly expected to provide reasons for his or her statements. A good essay in English literature or history or economics will argue a thesis and provide persuasive reasons. Apart from formal studies, it is expected that while a child and youth will have placed his faith in the word of his parents, as he grows up, he will not simply rely on them, but will himself see the reasons for his positions and act on the basis of personal conviction. The child necessarily acts on a natural faith because he lacks experience and a formed mind. But all expect that in due course reason will come into its own in his life. Sometimes though, and more often than we perhaps imagine, the notion of faith in something or someone is silently despised, especially in respect to religion. A culture which places a high store on scientific proof, on rational justification, on a healthy scepticism as to the views of authorities, can look askance at religion which, on the contrary, places considerable emphasis on faith. Religion, being concerned in the main with things which cannot be seen or empirically tested, depends normally on the word of the one who has, who has seen the matter in question. It recognises the authority of the one whose word is accepted as authoritative. It is accepted or presumed or known that the person on whom we rely has seen, in some sense, what we have not seen. His word on the matter is then dependable. Now, it ought to be plain that in itself this is a reasonable principle, even if in particular cases of, say, superstition and excessive credulity, it is not reasonable. Even in academic matters, we accept a certain level of faith in the high authority of a particular author in some field. Aquinas is a renowned authority in matters philosophical and theological, and to quote him on a point, as an authority on how things stand, is taken to be reasonable. The same is the case with Aristotle in, say, metaphysics, and other authorities could be cited in their respective fields. This presence of faith in ordinary life would open us to the reasonableness of faith in things of religion. Many religions have developed from some great soul's quest for the ultimate. Because of his quest, that person has attained certain outstanding perceptions that have then become the guide for millions of others. 
such as, say, Buddha, Confucius, and the Christian would say, Muhammad. In such cases, it is reasonable to have faith. Faith. It is faith in the word of another, whose authority is deemed to be vindicated by his religious achievement. It is a faith in a person judged to have possessed exceptional religious insights, not unlike the faith we exercise in other authorities of ordinary life. But where it is a question of a revealed religion involving the acceptance of mysteries, the knowledge of which could never have been attained by anyone, we are speaking of a faith that is absolutely fundamental. Our acceptance of those mysteries depends totally on faith in the word of the one who has made them known and declared them to be true. It is only by faith in him that we can know those mysteries. In the previous case, that of a religion which is simply the teaching and insights of a great religious leader, well, theoretically his disciples could come to see the, for themselves the truth or otherwise of his teaching. They can, by dint of following his path, eventually see what he, their teacher and leader, saw. They can judge its truth for themselves. His teaching is not beyond the mind and religious reason of man. But this is not so for a religion that is revealed by God and which involves realities beyond the capacity of the human mind to attain. In this case, the foundation is simply and entirely faith, faith in the word of the one who has revealed it. That person is, of course, Jesus Christ. He was preceded by the patriarchs and prophets of the chosen people, but their crown and fulfillment was Christ and his divine revelation. In this case, faith is imperative. It is the foundation of living the religion. Faith is the foundation of the Christian religion. Faith in the word of Christ, recognized as the Son of God made man. This faith is not of the order of human faith, for it would be beyond the capacity of man to place in Christ the total unreserved faith in him and in absolutely everything he has revealed. This faith is God's gift. It is the seed of today's parable, the seed mentioned by our Lord in the parable, Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 43, available to the well-disposed and especially to those who pray for it. By means of this divine faith, we are disposed by grace to place our faith in Christ, accepting all that he has revealed. This is the basis of holiness, of eternal life possessed now in its beginnings and in its fullness hereafter.